this idea of asking questions and listening and based on the answers ask additional questions so why am i telling you all that because if that doesn't sound like your cup of tea if you're more like hey i want to i want to like think like a surgeon i want to find what's wrong and i want to cut it out and move on you need to know that about yourself dr jonathan Bakhtari. you can see it i mean it's crystal clear i think it's going to really revolutionize things goes, which is a big game changer Welcome to another episode of Bakhtari MD. And today I want to talk to all my medical school friends about picking a specialty. So if I'm targeting the right audience, you are in your first, second, or maybe your third year medical school, and you're contemplating what kind of specialty to go into. It's interesting, uh, uh, just like my previous videos where I talked about, you know, picking medicine, that decision is made when you're 18 or 19. Picking your specialty is something you do in your early 20s. And, and just like that other episode, this decision you make in your early 20s is going to have a profound impact in your 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s. So I want people to realize that it's an immensely important decision. And what you decide to do in your 20s will impact you forever, potentially, unless you change specialties, which rarely happens. So let's talk about how to choose a medical specialty. And I don't want to get too granular. I do want to speak more broadly. I think the first decision people have to make when they're in medical school about their specialty is do they want to do primary care or do they want to do something else? I think that's the first fork in the road primary care. Do you want to be sort of the patient quarterback and have that position in patients' lives where you see them for general primary care? And for primary care, I include pediatricians. I include even OBGYNs and, uh, of course, internal medicine and family practice doctors. Those are sort of the front line. For a lot of women, their OBGYN is essentially their primary care doctor, although not always, uh, certainly, you know, pediatrics, even up until teenage years, the pediatrician's really the quarterback, and then internal medicine. And there are subspecialties of internal medicine like geriatrics, which is essentially primary care for the older population. But all of that falls under primary care. And I think there is something to be said about that. And I want to talk about that. When you're in medical school and you're thinking what primary care is going to be like, you need to first of all decide if that's something for you. Are you the kind of person that can see, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 patients a day and be their main quarterback? And for a lot of people, um, they may not understand that being a primary care physician involves a lot more than understanding medicine. I wish I could tell you that being knowledgeable in medicine will get you through primary care, but it won't. And I think, you know, one of the things that gives me unique insight in having these conversations is, you know, I've been on clinical faculty uh, over my career for many years in, in at least three medical schools, and I've worked with residents, I've worked with interns and medical students, and fellows. And so I've had, you know, uh, many years of trying to understand and help students and people going through the medical uh, uh, educational system. So if you have any specific concerns um, that I might be able to address for you uh, regarding, you know, your medical career or education, please leave in the comment section below and I'll try to address it. You know, I saw a statistic that one third, potentially up to one third of all primary care visits are for reassurance. There's nothing really wrong per se. Uh, maybe someone's having trouble at work, maybe some issues at home, and potentially it's creating some potential symptoms, or whatever, whatever the case may be. And they just wanna go to the doctor and make sure that it's nothing serious. So we call it reassurance. Now, if you're the kind of person that's okay with that, meaning you know that if you see three patients, one of them, is simply there to hear your voice. Is simply here, there to you tell them, no, you know, this sounds like it's gonna resolve on its own. 
it sounds like it's nothing too serious. Why don't we watch it? Why don't we wait? I wouldn't worry about it. That is what we mean by reassurance. So if you're not a good reassurer, primary care may not be the field for you. You have to go in there and understand that certain people there are simply paying to have a conversation with you. And if you're like the person who is very like, I want to know what the problem is. I want to solve it. Don't waste my time with anything that's not a problem. You may not be very good in primary care, right? Because there are people like that. They're like, hey, you know, don't bother me unless there is a real issue here. I'm not here just to have a conversation. I'm busy, blah, blah, blah. So I think the number one challenge in primary care is realizing you partially get paid to listen to people. That's it. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with just listening? Okay. And understanding and empathizing and potentially uncovering some non-medical issues. Are they having marital issues? You know, is it something else? Are there some, you know, concerns that, you know, you may need to bring, bring to a social worker, to authorities? Who knows? I mean, if you think you're going to go into primary care and simply just diagnose high blood pressure and diagnose a sore throat, that may not be the case. And I think what you'll see, and, and the really great primary care doctors get this, they get it. They get their part of what they do is reassure patients when something appears, you know, not serious. Now, a great primary care doctor may think it's nothing serious, but they'll be smart enough to say, Susie, Bill, I don't think there's anything we need to worry about. But, you know, why don't we just kind of lay low, watch it, come back in a month or two. If it's something still going on, you know, maybe we'll draw some blood or we'll get an x-ray or we'll, we'll do this or that. Because every once in a while, what you think is nothing turns out to be something. So the great ones, the really super duper ones can balance this level of reassurance, but still make sure it is nothing serious because even if there's one in a thousand chance that something someone's coming to you with is serious, but you know, the, the likelihood is only 1%, you don't want to miss that 1%, do you? I mean, who wants to miss that 1%? So how do you reassure someone and say, look, more than, you know, the odds are like almost zero that this is something serious, but on the off chance that it is, let me see you back in a month. Or sometimes you even just say, like, I, you know, I don't really think that is, but let's just draw some blood anyway, but I'm not really concerned. I think it's that ability to understand that there's a zero or 1% chance that this is maybe something serious, but keeping in mind, you don't want to miss the 1% because if you have a 20, 30, 40, 50 year career and only 1% of the time when you're reassuring someone, is there something seriously going on? you don't want to miss because you will eventually miss that 1%, right? In a long career, sooner or later, you're going to miss the 1%. And so it is a really tricky thing to be reassuring and, and say, don't worry about it, but understand when you need to do the follow-up. So I, I think understanding pri what primary care is all about is really, really important. And by the way, primary care doesn't always mean necessarily reassuring the patient. Sometimes it's a significant other, a spouse. In pediatrics, it's the parents, right? The parents who are going to drive you crazy, not the kids. You know, sometimes people go see their primary care doctor because someone else, you know, has a concern and your ability to either through the patient or if they're coming with the patient to address their concerns is really, really important. And I hit on one thing that I really want to talk about, which is listening. I think you you have to become the world's best listener in primary care because often you know patients aren't doctors they don't know how to connect the symptoms or their complaints in a way that will ring true to you about what what is going on so if a patient comes and says well you know my stomach hurts and blah 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 if you don't somehow say hey by the way have you lost weight too and they say oh yeah i've lost 30 pounds you know, this, this idea of asking questions and listening and based on the answers, ask additional questions. So why am I telling you all that? Because if that doesn't sound like your cup of tea, if you're more like, hey, I want to 
I want to like think like a surgeon. I want to find what's wrong and I want to cut it out and move on. You need to know that about yourself. You know, are you the kind of person that needs immediate satisfaction? Do you need to cut something out and move on or take out a mole and your job is done? I mean, I think for the most part, you know, if you're removing a mole, there isn't a whole lot of conversation beyond the, the superficial stuff like, yes, you know, it'll probably occur, not reoccur, or we'll send it for a, for a pathology report or whatever. So it's much more important in primary care, pediatrics included, and somewhat OBGYN, geriatrics, uh, what have you, internal medicine, to have that personality that allows you to relate to people and understand what's being said behind the words that they're using. And believe me, you get, you get better and better at that moving forward. So the next quality that I want to talk about primary care is this idea that you are the quarterback. You know, think of it as you're the wedding planner. You're not the photographer. You know, you're not the DJ. You're not the caterer. You are, you know, you're in charge of everything. You're, you're the planner. And Internal medicine and the rest of the primary care really requires you to be the maestro and, and, and understand when you need to refer a person out. You know, did, did the person who did the consultation on your patient, did they give you back some information that then you need to refer them out to someone else? And, and you need to manage your patients, especially these days as, you know, primary care is really becoming the gatekeeper. So understanding that part of your role is going to be to manage the patient, you know, manage, you know, how many medications, are there better medications? Should they be getting this test, that test? Should they be seeing this specialist? What are we going to do? The results of the feedback from that specialist, are we... They need to see a dietitian. Do they have an anxiety issue? Do they need, uh, you know, some coping skills to deal with their situations? What are the options? You know, do you, you know, put them on medication? Do you send them to a therapist? Do you send them to a yoga or something functional, meditation? These are all things that you are going to have to potentially put put in your your two cents worth. So primary care is not for people who don't want to do that. Uh, so it's very, very important that you understand that. Now, once you decide that you do or don't want to be in primary care, then the whole potpourri of specialties opens up. And I think, you know, it's very difficult to categorize all of them. But then, you know, you really are now set with either a surgical specialty, which involves neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, a general surgery, vascular surgery, colorectal surgery, uh, and on and on and on. So for a lot of these, you have to do a basic, you know, general surgery residency, and then go into subspecialties, some like urology, which involves a lot of surgery, and actually OBGYN involves a lot of surgery. Some of those uh, are not, c do not come out of general surgery. So if you're going to go into surgery, you need to figure out which ones are a branch of general surgery versus which one do you go into directly. And that's really, really important because that has a whole different life cycle if you want to go into urology versus doing uh, a general surgery residency. You know, if um, you're thinking of a certain specialty uh, and you want to uh, get some clarity on it, feel free to leave in the comment section below what you're thinking about and, you know, what are the issues for you? And I'll be happy to address it if I can. And yeah, and just kind of tell me what you're struggling with uh, in the comments below and um, you know we'll see if we can at least give you some insight. If you want to go into a surgery subspecialty you have to then understand after four years of medical school you're talking about five years of general surgery and then doing one two to three years of your subspecialty in surgery versus a surgical specialty that you go directly out of med school into. So that is one big decision. We could have a video just on that. The other thing that you need to decide is, you know, are there non-surgical specialties like radiology, although radiology has more procedures these days, uh, you know, pathology uh, and other radiation oncology and other non-surgical specialties that involve some procedures, but not 
what I would call true surgery. Uh, and there's something to be said about you know, a surgeon's mentality. Just like we talked about in internal medicine and primary care involving you being the quarterback, having conversations, you know, the personality for a lot of people who like surgery or their subspecialties is they get a lot of satisfaction out of, you know, having somebody come in, you know, with a busted knee, torn up uh, meniscus, whatever you, and fixing it and, you know, giving them immediate satisfaction where literally, you know, a few weeks or months later after surgery, the patient can really feel a difference. So I think a lot of people that go into surgical specialties like that feeling of doing something that, you know, uh, can make an impact. Yes, surgical specialties have chronic illnesses that they deal with, but they also do a lot of stuff that, you know, you come in with a infected appendix, you know, you're going to get taken care of and that problem's you know, basically going to go away ideally versus, you know, in primary care where if you have people with chronic illnesses, you may not get that Im immediate sense of satisfaction, but really managing more chronic illnesses versus in surgical specialties, Yes, there are chronic illnesses, you know, like, you know, wound infections and a lot of different chronic stuff that need surgical intervention, different types of colon diseases and what have you, inflammatory bowel diseases, and what have you. But by and large, a lot of surgical specialties get a little more immediate gratification on the subset of patients that they can immediately impact. And I think for a lot of people who get drawn into surgical specialties, that's a big lure. And, you know, in all fairness, I think a lot of them are less inclined to want to do this sort of one hour consultation just to understand, you know, what's behind the scenes going on with the person. But that's something that surgeons leave up to the primary care doctor. So by definition, they understand that, yes, of course, they're going to have to talk to patients, but they're going to be absolved from some of that, you know, what's behind the curtain kind of thing versus primary care doctors, they're really responsible to find out what's behind the curtain. What kind of personalities go into general surgery and its subspecialties and other surgical fields is that. Then you're left with the non-surgical specialties which are in primary care. And for a lot of those, you know, people have unique interests, whether it's in radiation physics and what have you, or different aspects of those subspecialties that draw people into pathology radiology, radiation oncology, or rehab medicine. A lot of those have very specific uh, lifestyle uh, advantages, disadvantages, as well as specific interests that people have. So that's a whole nother bucket of specialties that you can choose from. So the last thing I wanna cover are the subspecialties of internal medicine. So I know we covered, we put internal medicine as a primary care, but there is a way to go into internal medicine and not do primary care, which is to go into a subspecialty of medicine, internal medicine, which is cardiology, pulmonology, re, uh, nephrology, meaning renal. Uh, and all of those subspecialties of internal medicine allow you to remove yourself from that quarterback role and then still do something that's related to internal medicine, but not actually internal medicine. So infectious disease would fall in that category, you know, rheumatology, endocrinology, like I said, pulmonology, cardiology, critical care, all of those are branches that you can get to by going through primary care, which would be internal medicine. And then you have those host of specialties, which are definitely not surgical specialties. If you're going through internal medicine, you're not going to go into a surgical specialty, but some of those specialties have tons of procedures. Certainly cardiology, we're all aware of, you know, the cardiac catheterizations and other vascular procedures. And so, there are ways to go through the primary care route. And for a lot of people, that actually buys them some time. So if you're not sure at the end of medical school if you want to do primary care or not, one way to do it is to go internal medicine. You'll have three years to think about it. But by your third year or so, you'll have to start thinking, do I want to stop at the end of three years and become a subspecialist of uh, internal medicine, which by the way, the one, the largest one is a hospitalist. And I'll link the video where I talk about what a hospitalist is up there. That's also a subspecialty of internal medicine. So let's pull backwards. So I think in reviewing, 
when you're in medical school, you have to think, do I want to be primary care? Do I want to be not primary care? First decision out of the gate. If you want to be primary care, family practice, internal medicine, a pediatrics, OBGYN, and then from there, potentially you'll have some subspecialties coming out of internal medicine that you can do. If you want to go into surgical world, you have general surgery and then all the subspecialties of general surgery or directly into urology where you do like one year of general surgery, but not the full thing or some of the other uh, s surgical specialties where you essentially go directly with doing a, maybe a one year transition surgery uh, residency and then you can go into those. So, uh, and then lastly is to the whole category of that of specialties that aren't primary care, but aren't surgical, and those have their own lure and positives and negatives. So these are the decisions you need to make coming out of medical school. And ideally by the third year, you should have some inkling, certainly after you do all your rotations, your third year, uh, you will see that you'll gravitate towards one or the other, meaning surgical or non-surgical, primary care versus non-primary care, and things will start to make be clear and then you could you could still do electives your fourth year and a lot of people you know may do a one year a transitional year until they really decide and there are a lot of people too that within their first year can switch or i shouldn't say a lot some people but majority of people i think um make a decision and kind of stick with it thank you for watching make sure you comment like and subscribe if you like the content of this video if you have questions about this topic or any other topic please leave it in the comment section below also go to my website bakhtariamd.com for more content like this and also to sign up for my newsletter thank you and be well